Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Monday. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Tom Spore. I'm the Director of National Defense at the Heritage Foundation, and we've got a great program. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Our guest today, Brigadier General John Rafferty, will probably speak for about 10 minutes or so, and then I'll ask him some questions to get things going. But then we're gonna to turn to you, uh, the audience, for your questions, which you will submit in the box on the right-hand side of your screen. You just click the questions and, and type away. Uh, when you do enter your question, I'd ask you to enter your name and your affiliation if you have one. That way we can put your content, your question in the proper context. The program today is being recorded. It'll be available on the web about 48 hours after the event and available on Heritage org and we're also going to email you the link to it so our topic this morning is important efforts that the army is making to modernize its precision long-range fires capabilities in 2017 army leadership announced a reimagined effort to develop and field new capabilities in october of that same year the army announced six priorities to guide modernization and at the top of that list was long-range precision fires in the same announcement, the Army announced the creation or formation of eight multidisciplinary cross-functional teams, or CFTs, to manage their modernization priorities. And one of those was, of course, the Long Range Precision Fires Team located at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Well, now, two years later, the Army has made significant progress towards its goals. Many new programs have been initiated. Secretary of the Army Ryan McCarthy makes frequent reference to 31 signature systems. And as far as I can tell, he hasn't had to start talking about 30 systems or 29. And so he's, uh, they have not had any uh, serious problems as of yet. But modernization under the best of circumstances is hard. And these aren't the best of circumstances. We've got COVID-19 making everything more difficult. A flat budget that took place from 2020 to 2021. And uh, there's a lot of people in town predicting that there'll be flat budgets in the future. And then finally, Congress, in its role of providing oversight, can often introduce uncertainty in its programs. We'll talk about all that and more with our guests today. To help us understand the Army's efforts, we're fortunate to have with us Brigadier General John Rafferty, the director of the Long Range Precision Fires Cross-Functional Team, and I invite him to join me now on screen. General Rafferty assumed the duties as director of the Long Range Precision Fire CFT in July 2018. And in that capacity, he leads a comprehensive effort to deliver cutting edge surface to surface fires that increase the range and effects over current systems. General Rafferty enlisted in the Army in 1987, I think as an infantryman, as later commissioned in the artillery branch. He served in multiple key leadership positions including commander of the 1st Battalion, 319th Airborne Field Artillery Battalion, and the 18th Field Artillery Brigade. He's had assignments in the Army's Legislative Liaison Office and has had multiple deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. General Rafferty will speak for a few minutes and then I'll return and we'll get to some questions, both yours and mine. So, General Rafferty, over to you, sir. Sure, good morning. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the introduction and, and for the opportunity to to uh, to give some remarks and answer questions and and uh, do what I think is an important part of the cross functional team job, which is to communicate uh, what Army Futures Command is doing to uh, to deliver uh, on these 31 plus three as you call them, but uh, but more importantly to deliver uh, key modernization capabilities to our to our soldiers in the field uh, that commanders can employ in a uh, against a, a pacing threat. Uh, so I, I've been uh, the cross-functional team director out here at Fort Sill for about uh, for about two years now, and uh, and I think I'm just getting started. Uh, I don't anticipate going anywhere anytime soon, uh, and so I am very focused on 2023, uh, and I plan to be here to to help deliver uh, some of these systems to the field. Uh, our cross-functional team is is at about 25 uh, people here at uh, here at Fort Sill. Uh, it's a mix of military and civilian. Uh, we're at about 40% uh, in the office and 60% telework, and that uh, kind of rotates on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, being here at Fort Sill has been pretty inspiring uh, to watch as a tenant unit to watch the training base uh, and uh, the operational units that are here uh, figure out how to keep going uh, in uh, in a COVID environment. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, and like I said, it's, it's just been inspiring to watch leaders uh, figure it out uh, and, and work together across this big team at Fort Sill. Uh, and then in talking to many of our industry partners, uh, I think that we have a lot in common. Uh, the Army can't stop making soldiers. Uh, you can't take a few months off and make it up at the end of the year, uh, just like our industry partners who are under contract to deliver uh, uh, systems and munitions and, and other things that the Army is counting on. You can't take a few months off and then expect to make it up later. Uh, so, uh, so I think we've got a lot in common uh, and we have figured it out. The Army's machine and we got to keep it going just like, uh, uh, just like many of you out there have, uh, have figured it out. So um, I mentioned our team here at Fort Sill, but that's that's not all of us. It's not it's not even the beginning of us. Our uh, our most important partners at uh, at Picatinny Arsenal, at the Detroit Arsenal, uh, and at uh, Redstone Arsenal. At Redstone, we've got the Aviation and Missile Center uh, as part of CCDC, uh, who are doing our rocket and missile uh, science and technology work, uh, and uh, we've got the PEO Storm, the Strategic and Operational Missiles. I'm sorry, PM Storm under PEO Rockets and Missiles, and that's our uh, partner for the Prism Missile from the acquisition side. Uh, at Picatinny Arsenal, we've got uh, the Armament Center from CCDC, and we've also got uh, the PM for Combat Ammunition Systems under P JPEO Ammunition. And then at Detroit, we've got uh, the Ground Vehicle Systems Center. Uh, also part of CCDC, and then our uh, PM partner there for self-propelled howitzer, howitzers under uh, under the PEO. Uh, and so that's the beginning of our government team. Uh, and uh, and then and then we consider our industry teammates to be just as uh, just as critical uh, uh, members on our team as as our government teammates. Uh, so in uh, in terms of you know Army Futures Command, uh, two years into it, uh, what are we doing to maintain? Uh, momentum, uh, and this uh, really comes from our from our headquarters at uh, at at Austin, Texas, and it uh, I use a couple bumper stickers, but uh, but I'll explain them a little bit. Number one, uh, winning matters, uh, and uh, winning together matters more. And 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 what we mean by that is that uh, is that uh, not just uh, the the cross functional team that I mentioned earlier, that big team of government and uh, uh, and industry. Uh, but it's also we've we've got to be winning with the Army uh, and we've got to begin to bring the Army into our experimentation to a to a, uh, a deeper level. Uh, we've got to connect with them to let them know what's coming uh, as we work across the dot ML, MLPF domains. Uh, and then we also um, have got to increase the, the frequency uh, and um, and effectiveness of our soldier touch points uh, to make sure that uh, that we are, like I said, winning together. Uh, the second point is, uh, is this integration, I'm sorry, intersection of technology and concepts. Uh, I'll put it uh, more like this, and that's, and that's research-informed concepts and concepts-informed research. Uh, and we think that isn't just inside the government team, but it also brings our industry partners in uh, so that uh, technology can show us what's possible in terms of concepts, and our emerging concepts can, can uh, point the direction for where our investments in technology should be. Uh, and, uh, and some of that's coming through, uh, through a program called Ignite out of the Futures and Concept Center, uh, but, uh, but that's a, uh, a big effort for us uh, going forward. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, soldier-centered design. And I hit that earlier when I mentioned soldier touch points, uh, but, uh, but I'll just use an example of one. And, and I, I, I probably too often say that it's easy to underestimate the value of, of getting soldiers together with engineers. Uh, but last week under the leadership of our, uh, our HQE here, uh, Jim Ackerman, uh, took a, a howitzer section from Fort Carson uh, to the Picatinny Arsenal and got them in the uh, in the back of our Urca Prototype Zero uh, before it uh, right before it shipped uh, back out to Yuma. And during this soldier touch point, uh, it was uh, it was a very important one to get after the uh, the final configuration of the supercharged propellant, uh, whether or not it should be a um, what configuration should be one single long uh, uh, propellant increment um, into two smaller pieces. What size should those pieces be? Uh, get at the stowage because uh, we want to maximize the onboard kills. Uh, so, uh, so what's the best way for us to stow this while we're still in this uh, in this early design phase? Uh, so, a um, when you see uh, the the this um, 
you know, this engagement between our operators in the field, our experts, uh, and our engineers who are the best in the world at designing this. Uh, it is two world-class uh, uh, partners getting together, and the outcomes from that are so powerful uh, that, uh, that, we, that we just got to increase the frequency at, uh, of those uh, every chance we get. And making that happen in a COVID environment was something that uh, my, my hat's off to CCDC and the Armament Center for, uh, uh, for figuring out a way to keep doing the hands-on engineering in, the, in those locations, but, uh, but able to bring in others for, uh, for this uh, important uh, feedback. Uh, so I'll, I'll move quickly through our uh, through our programs, uh, and and maybe if you go to the uh, go to the next slide now, that might be the the best way to keep me on time and to uh, uh, and uh, to walk through them. Uh, but uh, but I'll I'll work from uh, from right to left here, and and the uh, uh, at the tactical level, the extended range cannon artillery system, uh, it's just that a system. It's our most complicated uh, program because it's the platform, it's the propellant, uh, it's the projectiles, and it's the course correcting fuses all delivered together so it's a capability uh, that we're delivering to the field and not just bits and pieces of, uh, of an, you know, some kind of an improvement. So in 2023, we'll deliver a battalion set of IRCA um, platforms uh, with, uh, with propellant and, uh, and projectiles and course correcting fuses uh, to have accuracy uh, at, uh, at 70 kilometers. Uh, this will give uh, this formation will be a battalion formation in a Davarti, so a general support artillery battalion for the division commander to shape the brigade combat team's close fight. Our approach to IRCA is improve range, lethality, and then increase the rate of fire. Uh, so we are on our path to the first two, getting the range and, uh, and lethality in 23, uh, while we're working on improving the rate of fire. We've got two paths on the rate of fire. One is a government design autoloader, and then we're going out to, uh, to industry uh, and non-traditionals uh, in a way to improve the rate of fire. Uh, and, uh, and this said, I don't care if it's an autoloader. I don't care if there's cannoneers setting fuses in there, but if there's a way that we can increase the rate of fire in, a, in, in, a, uh, in an alternate way, uh, I'd, um, I'd absolutely uh, want to consider that. And, uh, and then that it really goes to the success we've had with the Army Applications Lab. Uh, through uh, through a cohort uh, program that we looked at uh, autonomous resupply. So I think we've cracked into this non-traditional um, community that uh, uh, that that now I think trusts us a little bit. Try to break down some barriers for doing business with uh, with the government and with the Department of Defense. Uh, and uh, and now we think we've got some credibility based on some early prototype we're doing for autonomous resupply. Uh, we're going to rolling this uh, this Sibber out, uh, really, I think as we speak, it's going out today. Uh, moving quickly to the uh, the operational uh, uh, level, we've got the Precision Strike Missile. So that's our replacement for the ATACMS missile. Uh, the Precision Strike Missile will go more than 500 kilometers, uh, and, uh, and it will be delivered under an urgent material release in 2023. Uh, we've got a, a, a great industry partner. We've got three successful flight tests. Uh, we feel pretty uh, pretty confident in our in our 23 uh, uh, delivery. Uh, we have an, an outstanding opportunity uh, that has presented itself to us over the last uh, five or six months, and that is to accelerate the integration of the uh, of the multi-mode seeker. This multi-mode seeker on the front of the uh, uh, the uh, the precision strike missile will give us the ability to attack maritime targets in the Pacific and emitting IADs in uh, in in uh, in Europe. And, uh, and that is really the capability that uh, the commanders want. And, uh, and we have the opportunity to do that. We're asking for, uh, uh, for some support uh, to, to, um, uh, to take advantage of this acceleration opportunity. And right now, the, uh, the multi-mode seeker testing is, is off to a good start with a captive carry test in, in, uh, in June in, uh, at the Redstone Test Center that I attended. Uh, and then in the fall, we'll get it out to, um, uh, to White Sands Missile Range against a representative target uh, that uh, that will do another captive carry and then begin to put it in surrogate missiles uh, so that we're burning down some of the risk for uh, integration into prism by uh, firing it in a um, uh, in a in a similar uh, missile in a similar environment and then over to the strategic systems and I got about 30 seconds left uh, and and uh, be we'll be ready for uh, for questions and uh, and there we really have two prongs here so so first uh, the long-range hypersonic weapon uh, being uh, under uh, Lieutenant General Thurgood's uh, leadership at RICTO, we are in support of him. We've written the abbreviated CDD for the, uh, for the capability, uh, and we will continue to be partnered with him uh, along the way. Uh, 
uh, the uh, the Fire Center of Excellence is doing as they do. They do the rest of the domains for uh, for .dot MLPF uh, integration, uh, but uh, but we are like I said uh, in support. Uh, and then for the uh, strategic long range cannon, which you can see a uh, uh, a cartoon uh, there of it, uh, but that is uh, Army Futures Command's number one science and technology uh, investment, uh, and we are on a path to uh, demonstrate the full range capability of this in uh, in 2023. Uh, along the way, we've uh, we've knocked down three of the uh, of the major technology milestones uh, that were laid out by the Army Science Board, uh, and uh, and we're on the way to to knock down the next one. So uh, so right now that that program is uh, is is really on time and on budget, and uh, and, and that means a lot. So that is where we are on our uh, signature systems. Uh, we're doing quite a bit of work on uh, on sensor to shooter. Uh, and uh, and I look forward to uh, to talking a little bit about our experimentation path uh, uh, now that the now that uh, the the Fight Club rule is over, so we can talk about project convergence now. So I'm I'm happy to answer any questions you might have on that, or on any of our uh, our uh, um, platform efforts that that we're working on. Uh, but again, back to uh, to General Sport. Thank you very much for uh, for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to uh, to taking questions from uh, from this great group that you've got assembled. Over. Yeah, General Rafferty, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, and really, uh, really inspiring to see what you guys are doing. My first question: uh, We hear a lot about uh, long-range precision fires. Are the Army's uh, number one priority? And I know uh, I'm just curious how that priority, which the Army has uh, ascribed your team, kind of translates to your level. Do you do you get first? Uh, dibs, if you will, on funding, or do you? How does that work, or is it really kind of you don't really see a difference down where you are? Well, um, whenever uh, whenever all the CFT directors are together with uh, um, with AFC or for any kind of body, I always have to go first uh, when it comes time to <laughs> deliver remarks. So, uh, so, so that that that's what comes with it. So we get them a, a lot of attention, but but I, I think that we're. Um, do we have the most money uh, in our, um, you know, in our lines? No. Uh, are we resource first? Uh, yes. Uh, and um, and do we have uh, the priority from uh, not just across AFC, from but from across the Army? Uh, and I'd say yes, we do. So uh, that uh, that sort of goes to priorities at, uh, at test facilities, uh, priorities for uh, for analysis from uh, from track, from CAA, from others. Uh, that goes to um, I think. Um, I sort of mentioned uh, priority of resources and, and priority support from like the Legislative Affairs Office to make the, uh, you know, to conduct the engagements that we need to. Uh, so I so I think that the, you know, the number one priority uh, carries a uh, carries a lot of weight. Uh, I think that uh, that also it it uh, it's recognized in uh, the Army's uh, experimentation path as well as the multi-domain task force, which is not a fire centric organization, uh, but it is. Uh, the type of outfit that's going to give us uh, the opportunity to do uh, an enormous amount of learning uh, on the employment of our systems between now and, and 23. So the formalization of of the of the role that the MDTF is going to play as an experimentation arm for AFC, uh, I think is uh, is really critical and another sort of recognition, not just of LRPF, but of uh, of the priorities and how those priorities need support from uh, from the Army. Over. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Got a question about the targeting and the fire control of these new systems, which now, you know, ATACMs went far, but in, you're talking about things that go much further than ATACMs. And um, I left the service a while ago, but we would have, the range of these systems exceeds what we would have even allocated to a core commander. They would have been the, maybe the province of the Air Operations Center or something like that. I'm interested in, do, does the strategic cannon, does the precision missile, do they drive the need uh, for new joint organizations to kind of uh, fuse their efforts, fuse the targeting efforts, or do we have the, the organizations we need? And I'm interested also uh, in the multi-domain task force and its role in all that. So uh, thanks for that. And we and we do uh, try to take an you know an end-to-end -end, uh, look at, uh, at at this. And I know on our team we have a um, uh, we call them the intel and, and targeting team. We've got a a um, military intelligence uh, major uh, who was job before coming here was a uh, was a Devardi S2, uh, and uh, so he's a good background for uh, uh, for this uh, position, uh, and a couple of um, 
uh, targeting officers, uh, CW4 and CW5 uh, Army targeting officers, uh, and we've aligned one of our science and technology professionals as part of this to round out this team. Uh, and 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 so we are uh, partnered in support of a customer, um, but but I'd say just joined at the hip with uh, with the ISR task force, uh, with uh, TenCap, uh, with Army G2. Uh, with the AI task force and all the all the people that are working on modernized systems for this, uh, and so that goes with the ground station for uh, uh, for taking advantage of space-based uh, high altitude aerial and terrestrial uh, systems. Uh, that will uh, that that I think for me the the biggest trick uh, in this uh, in this system is not just that it sucks all the intel in and it'll have some some AI capabilities that that will help identify targets. I mean, we can believe that that that's uh, that that we're going to have the ability to do that, and we're already demonstrating it now. Uh, but but one of the one of the problems that's frustrated uh, I think targeteers and and uh, and commanders for a long time is is stripping out what's what's TS uh, from what's secret from uh, from some of the you know national assets or whatever it just it's a it's a time consuming cumbersome uh, process and 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 we're developing systems that are going to strip that out uh, automatically uh, and uh, and give us access to the targets and so we what we want is to follow our targeting methodology, what I think is is very sound uh, for the uh, for the future, uh, and it's you know decide, detect, deliver, and assess. So decide up front. It's a high payoff target list that a commander approves. It's an order uh, that if you find these targets, and then the second part of that is the target selection standards, and it meets those target selection standards in terms of accuracy, timeliness, etc. Then you must. Uh, interdict those targets. It's not uh, so. So that feeds very well. Those are rules uh, that that fit very well into uh, into you know automated systems. Uh, follow these rules. Meets all these uh, meets the requirements. It's inside a permissive uh, fire support coordination measure. Uh, then uh, that that enables us uh, to to shoot quickly. We don't need to ask for permission again. Uh, and we can generate the uh, the calls for fire, have humans on the loop as it goes, uh, and um, and monitoring. So so I think I think uh, our experimentation and the development of our of the systems are are going to enable uh, uh, commanders and units to uh, to meet the the, the time standards uh, to engage um, uh, you know a high volume of of targets on a hyperactive battlefield. Uh, now to your uh, to your question about um, about it, I think I think. Probably the terminology we're using now is theater RISTA, uh, and that uh, that really encompasses space-based, uh, high-altitude, um, you know, aerial and terrestrial uh, systems that uh, that theater commanders are, are going to have access to uh, because of some of these ground station systems that uh, that that we're developing, uh, and uh, I think a degree of of uh, of, of unity uh, across. Um, uh, the Intel community and the operational force in a way that that I haven't seen before, uh, and the Intel community coming to us say we want to find targets for you. So it's a little bit more than this Intel supports targeting. It's it's active um, uh, finding targets because they know that the situation we're in, you know, the central problem of uh, of multi-domain operations are these uh, these A2 AD systems that uh, uh, that we're going to have to find and kill together. Uh, and then and then I think you know the the MDTF. In, in terms of its role, it 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 um, yeah, you know, I want to speak for for Jim Eisenhower and and uh, as he you know as he figures it figures it out, uh, but uh, but I but I think that um, that it is going to have uh, not just access to the to the right uh, type of theater level uh, RISTA, uh, but but the idea is it, it will also have the authorities that uh, that it needs. Uh, to uh, to attack targets uh, at ranges and spaces that that we haven't before. And clearly, I know this this challenges people's idea of where a fire support coordination line is and things like that. And those are all things we have to work through. We, we haven't sorted uh, those things out. But but what I, I think, but but I, I I'm convinced uh, that um, that across the joint force we all recognize uh, that there's enough targets out there for all of us, and we're going to have to figure out how to uh, how to make this. Um, how to sort this out, um, whether it's uh, whether it's um, you know different battle space geometries, 
uh, or uh, or creative, uh, as we call in the artillery, uh, org for combat. So so uh, the strategic fires battalions, who are they working for at what time, uh, and uh, and what commander during what phase of the operation. Uh, I, I think um, you know as a fire supporter and artillery, I'm pretty comfortable with that kind of uh, approach to things. And and like I said, the experimentation going forward is is going to be a great opportunity for us. Sorry for the long answer. No, that was wonderful. Um, uh, we, we got a lot of questions coming in. We're going to turn to those in a second. I got one that uh, I don't even know if it's a question, but I guess it is. And so uh, I wanted to clarify one thing. One of your slides, and we might have messed this up, had the caliber of IRCA as 0.58 caliber, and then another one had the caliber is 58 caliber. And the answer, I think, is it's a 58 caliber gun, and caliber really uh, gets to the length of the barrel. And so I, I read somewhere that if you take the caliber, uh, times the uh, diameter of the barrel, 155 millimeters in this term, you get about a 29-foot barrel on IRCA is what is kind of where we're at right now. And I'm wondering, does that big, long barrel present any uh, issues in terms of rail loading or loading on any other uh, mobility platform? So uh, great question, and you nailed it with the uh, with the caliber length. It's multiples of bore diameter is uh, is how you do the uh, the length, and it's 58 calibers, uh, and uh, it's a long gun tube. It's uh, you know 29, 30 feet, uh, and that's uh, you know that's that's one of the ways uh, that you get range: uh, bigger chamber, more propellant, longer gun tube, um, and. So it was a concern up front. So uh, this is, a, I think, a great example of this teamwork across AFC in, in ways that maybe the Army hasn't been able to, uh, to do it before. And we recognized up front that, uh, that there were concerns from the operational force about the length of the gun tube and its effect on tactical mobility. Uh, so ATEC uh, set up a, uh, an urban uh, terrain course at Aberdeen Proving Ground. And we got, uh, you know, we got soldiers to, to operate the platform. They mocked it up. We didn't have an IRCA ready yet. But they mocked it up with the 29-foot gun tube uh, and the uh, the dimensions on the on the back of the cab, and uh, and they they ran the they ran the obstacle course uh, and uh, did the 60-degree slope, did the um, uh, on and off C-17. I saw the pictures of that. It was it was pretty impressive, uh, and uh, on and off rail cars. Uh, so um, so early on, uh, we kind of we reduced uh, some of the concerns uh, of about that and about about tactical and strategic mobility uh, it's and one of the things that was counterintuitive on this was that using the the you know the dve the driver's aid uh that's used when they're when they're down in the hatch uh the normally when a self-propelled howitzer is driving the the dve the the driver can't see the end of the gun tube so it's very difficult for them to to, to drive under those conditions and and when it's in that travel lock position and it takes the section chief to constantly uh tell them where the where the gun tube is as they're navigating uh difficult terrain with the 25 foot gun tube he can see the uh the end of the the gun tube so he, actually the the thing that was surprising was he said it was easier to drive uh with the longer one because he he could see where it was uh, the whole time when he was, uh, like I said, in that degraded environment. Uh, but but uh, we uh, we address those concerns early and uh, are are pretty comfortable uh, with it. And and that ATEC partnership has continued all along the way uh, between them, the PM, and and the lab, and addressing uh, not just mobility but durability and and, and reliability uh, as we you know make the chassis a little bit heavier. Over. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, I'm going to turn to the questions from the audience, which have been coming in uh, fairly steadily, but that doesn't mean you can't get a question in. So go ahead and submit one, please. Uh, this one comes from Christian Malord, and he asks, can the architecture of the long-range precision fire platforms uh, be adapted to other armed forces? And so you think of our NATO partners or uh, maybe Japan or some others who we have key security relationships with. You know, is there talk or is there discussion or are you building these systems that could potentially be used by one of our allies over it. Uh, so, yes, um, we are, uh, I think, uh, open for business with our with our allies, and we've had some interest in in uh, in the the IRCA platform and and, and the munitions. 
Uh, there's been uh, some collaboration already on, uh, on on some of the propellant and things where uh, some of our partners are are not necessarily ahead but have different approaches to things and, and uh, so I think there's some the difficult to get the range but some cratas that, uh, that that we've gotten that uh, that I think are going to be are going to be helpful long term uh, and uh, and the precision strike missile is one that's uh, is has gotten some some interest from from quite a few partners uh, so we so we definitely uh, want to want to you know we definitely want to share this technology with the right uh, with the right partners uh, one other thing to consider is as, as we look on our experimentation path for convergence uh, you know this year it's kind of some cfts getting together and having a combined arms exercise uh, next year uh, with the uh, joint modernization command running it as part of afc uh, with the mdtf and, and and potentially a division headquarters it's going to be a, you know obviously a, a bigger one with joint partners so uh begin to bring in jad c2 uh like uh like elements but then in 22 we want this to be a uh um, open to coalition partners uh so uh, you know as we're going forward we want to um we want to converge not just uh you know across domains of our uh um uh, us but uh but begin to bring in coalition partners too oh. Yeah, great, John. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Oris Davis asked a question about: Is there a role for connected munitions in the LRPF? And then, and if so, do you have any kind of thoughts or details on that? So, uh, so connected and collaborative uh, munitions are are definitely um, what we're thinking about for uh, for improved lethality of the uh, of the Urca platform. At, at extended ranges. Uh, so right now, um, you know, XM1113 is our is our rocket-assisted projectile that'll get out to 70 kilometers. We're going to have Excalibur uh, that will also get out to to 70 kilometers. Uh, we're bringing in the uh, the um, uh, cannon-delivered area effects munition, which is the DPICM replacement efforts. There's a there's an anti-armor aspect of that, and then a and then a light medium uh, uh, component of that. And so those begin to bring in submunition. Um, um, and uh, and so we're we're looking at ways for those for those submunitions to to collaborate, uh, and then as we uh, as we also uh, think about 130 kilometers for uh, for Urca, which is the uh, you know the objective uh, range of the system. Uh, you know we've we've got a head start on a on a couple of things from uh, from ramjet or from uh, the hypervelocity projectile, and uh, and. And at those extended ranges, and at the you know the those are going to be um, you know pretty pretty expensive projectiles, but going after you know high value targets at extended ranges, and 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 so those things have got to be hit to kill, and it can't be two hits for a kill. It's got to be uh, those, so those munitions are going to have to have some some collaborative uh, uh, mechanisms uh, to make sure that we maximize the uh, you know the effects of a volley of of those you know expensive munitions. So the answer is yes. Over. Thank you. Um, here's a great question from Abraham Mashey, and he asks, and I'll, I'll do a disclaimer up front, you're not an intelligence officer, and this is an unclassified uh, webinar, but could you compare, at least in your judgment, where we are and where we're heading with our kind of peer competitors, China, Russia, are we, are we going fast enough, and um, have we caught up, or when do you see us catching up in terms of hypersonics? Uh, so, I, I guess up up front, we'll say is that um, is that I think we're there isn't a moment to lose. I think we're on a we're on a path for 23 that uh, that that keeps us um, maintains the idea of combined arms overmatch for us, and that's what we're after. Uh, we're never going to have more cannon systems or even more rockets and missiles, but uh, but we do uh, better than any army in the world is is fight as a combined arms team, uh, and uh, and so. That's um, you know that's why LRPF is is the first priority because it enables combined arms maneuver uh, and uh, and it enables uh, access to the operating area as part of uh, part of the joint force at the strategic and operational level. Uh, so um, so 23 is important uh, and uh, and 23 is in in, in my estimation uh, fast enough. Uh, and then we have an aim point force for uh, for when uh, we need to have a certain level of moder modernization uh, across the army. Uh, to maintain, uh, to maintain, I would say that that combined arms overmatch. Um, so the the hypersonic delivery of a of a prototype capability in 23 uh, is, um, you know, is 
is is as fast as we can get there. Uh, and I, and I, in my estimation, it's uh, it's fast enough given uh, my uh, knowledge of our of our you know near peer competitors. Uh, but along all these modernization uh, efforts, there isn't uh, isn't a moment to lose. And uh, and so there are some ways in which our adversaries have advantages uh, in um, in in uh, in terms of. Uh, what level of reliability they're they're able to put out there? What uh, you know? What um, uh, you know? Maybe more predictable funding, those sorts of things. So they do have, uh, I think, some advantages uh, in as that goes. But but I think when it comes to over you know operational effectiveness, uh, the the rigor that's put into our systems in terms of uh, uh, the technical requirements, uh, you know, the safety and reliability, uh, and just the, uh, you know, the, the world-class, uh, you know, S&T backbone of uh, CCDC uh, is um, is going to make sure that, that what we have out there is, uh, is um, uh, provides that overmatch. Over. Great. Thank you. So this question comes from a Brigadier General Christopher Spillman, U.S. Army retired, who, who knows more about these efforts, obviously, than I do. Uh, but he, he asked, can you talk about the role of Titan and AFATADS to the Army's multi-domain operations and pro project convergence efforts, and what maybe the role might be of uh, artificial intelligence and in all this? So, um, so Titan, Titan will be that uh, the ground station that uh, that brings it in, and, and we're working on some applications that uh, that will uh, that will use. Um, AI uh, to sort through um, enormous uh, quantities of, of uh, information and find targets uh, and find targets that uh, that meet the that are on the high payoff target list approved by the commander on the target selection uh, that meet the target selection standards uh, and uh, and then generate a uh, call for fire said so I don't want a picture of it don't want an image don't want anything what we want is the call for fire just like we'd get from a uh, uh, from uh, a sergeant with a pair of binoculars and a, and a radio. Uh, the call for fire. The, the elements of the call for fire. And then, uh, and then, and then, a FATADS, uh, and its its partner in in many of this is uh, is JDOX. Uh, but a FATADS uh, is um, is is central to all our modernization priorities. Uh, and uh, and it's it's not a 31 plus three, but it's uh, but it's in our orbit. Uh, because uh, because we're entirely reliant on that and our mission command systems, our command and control systems to to uh, to employ these. And so the uh, um, at a you know a FATADS is what does the attack guidance matrix. Uh, so what's the right platform to engage this? Uh, and uh, and we can work on automating that portion of it uh, as well. In fact, many of those tools exist in uh, in a FATADS. Uh, in uh, in ways that we don't necessarily uh, uh, use them, but we're going to have to uh, going forward. Uh, so uh, so those two uh, those two systems are are absolutely um, central to all of our modernization priorities. And JDOX is what enables us to talk to uh, joint platforms and others. It it does so much more than than translate, uh, but um, but that translation function of uh, J series message to K series messages is, uh, is an essential function that, that can't be replaced by anything else. So. Excellent, great, thank you. Um, good question here from Carla Zeppieri, the House Armed Services Committee. Can you discuss or give us your your team's priority objectives for project convergence? Yeah, so so in uh, project convergence. Uh, which we'll do in um, yeah in a month a month from now we'll be in the in the middle of it at, at Yuma and General Ross Kaufman is uh, is kind of the uh, he's the platoon leader there right now with uh, uh, with the uh, you know with the advanced party from all the cross functional teams that are participating that that are uh, General Gallagher is coming in to be the signal officer for this and they're running the Comex uh, starting uh, starting tomorrow Comex two uh, and and right now our uh, our systems with our uh, uh, We've got a couple of chief warrant officers that are there with the with the team putting the uh, putting our comms architecture together, and and I, and I think we're we're luckily a, a ahead of the game. And but but to your to your question is we've got a couple of essential fire support tasks uh, for uh, for each phase of the uh, of the operation, uh, and it will follow this uh, MDO like uh, um, approach of penetrate, disintegrate, and exploit. Uh, and uh, and during the, the penetration, it's uh, the 
the destruction, I'm sorry, the neutralization of, uh, of um, um, an air defense system uh, during penetration, it's destruction of a uh, long range artillery system. And, uh, and those are, those, those are the, the tasks that we're doing. And, and so behind that, there's a lot of things we, we've got to do. So we've got to receive uh, the, uh, the, the target information from a Titan surrogate uh, so the Titan system isn't ready yet, but there's there's a there's a, a process and a, and a system that we're using as a surrogate for that. Uh, so that's being generated, uh, then uh, then transmitting uh, across the tactical network uh, to a FATAT, uh, which um, which will which will send the, uh, the the fire command down to uh, down to IRCA for that. So there's a lot of learning demands in that in terms of time standards and and. Uh, uh, and, uh, and and accuracy standards, and, and will inform some crew drill uh, inside the IRCA. So from really from a hands-on cannoneer uh, all the way back to targeteer, uh, we've got learning demands all along the way for for uh, for each of them. And I, and I think for each of the cross-functional teams, it's very similar uh, that um, that there's uh, there's sort of micro and macro uh, learning demands. Uh, the, uh, the 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 collection plan for uh, for project convergence is uh, is just as important as the uh, you know as the as the tactical demonstration plan. And so we've got uh, uh, the data and analysis center. Uh, we've got um, uh, track. We've got uh, three or four other uh, analysis organizations that are all um, uh, falling in on uh, each one of the locations. Uh, as collectors, I mean, so and so some are surveys. They're asking people how, you know, what did they do? How did it work? Uh, but there's also guys with stopwatches, and and there's uh, and there's uh, all sorts of other um, analysis. The collection of that data, where's it go? What do we do with it? Uh, that's also being uh, being handled, and and um, it's uh, a little bit of an obsession for uh, AFC headquarters right now is uh, is collection of that data and then what we do with it. Over. Yeah, thanks. That's excellent. Yeah, so uh, next question, and I'm, and I'm going through them quickly because I want to get to as many possible. This one comes from Lieutenant Colonel Eric Jorgensen. He's at the Air, Land, Sea Application Center, and he's interested in knowing the efforts to synchronize your efforts with the Air Force in terms of these fire capabilities that, you know, in the old way of thinking of them, you know, everything beyond, you know, the fire support coordination level line belong to the Air Force. And these, these are clearly in that area, and I'm, I'm, he's interested in that. A coordination. Yeah. Uh, well, great question from a, uh, a well-positioned, um, uh, you know, partner. And I think this uh, this collaboration across the services now on JADC2 uh, is is going to drag us uh, all into uh, that discussion. And uh, and so I'm I I really uh, I really welcome the opportunities to talk more seriously about that and and. You know, some of it's occurred. There's been some Army and Air Force talks of, uh, about these things. There's been some, I think, some uh, some uh, discussions about uh, roles and missions that uh, that's probably not uh, really relevant to where the services are. Uh, and and I, I think that, uh, like I said, this this um, this recognition uh, that a um, that a combined uh, Joint all-domain uh, command and control system uh, is um, is essential to us fighting and winning in in the uh, you know in a in a, in a future multi-domain environment is um, is absolutely essential for uh, for um, starting to um, uncover uh, a lot of those uh, uh, friction points that that are going to happen are going to occur in the future and they're and they're friction only because it's not how we've done it before. It's not that we don't recognize we got to do things differently in the future, uh, and differently is is there's probably degrees of difference. It's not I don't I don't even see this as as a, uh, as a major changes. It's um, and and I think a recognition across all the services that uh, that that there's there's uh, there's there's room for change in in in, uh, in how we fight in the future. Over. Yeah, excellent. So next question. Uh, this one's interesting. I think it's from John Milner. He's at American Rhine Metal. Defense and he's uh, he's gives you congratulations for getting the 70 kilometers with IRCA and uh, but he also uh, I guess knows that is the higher propellant you put in the barrel the more your barrel is going to wear and so he's interested in uh, second third order effects of when you put that kind of range uh, on there is that going to wear out the barrel much more quickly over yeah so so. Well, great question from John, uh, who um, is another, um, 
you know, well-positioned uh, partner out there uh, with who knows this business. And uh, and he's right that um, that the higher chamber pressures, faster muzzle velocities, higher temperatures uh, do wear uh, the barrels. And 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 so one of the things that you can do to offset the wear on the barrels is improve the rotating band on the outside of the projectiles. Uh, and so we're pretty close to down selecting the right material uh, for the uh, uh, for the rotating band. Uh, in fact, we just uh, we had a little bit of a team a, a mini team week last week uh, over uh, Clapper Tools, and and so if, if memory serves, I think we're about six months away from from down selecting on the rotating band, and that that'll help a lot with uh, concerns about barrel wear. And then once we have the right material, then we can really figure out what we think the barrel life is for all, at at the uh, at the maximum. Um, shots or maximum uh, propellant shots uh the um you know the other thing to consider is investments in in uh in, in improved barrel technology and and uh and where we are now with uh uh, uh cold spray uh tantalum cold spray versus uh chromine which is uh which is what we do now um the the cold spray on a on a rifled barrel is is a is not a uh, small undertaking, uh, so that's uh, that's a that's a couple years away till we're ready to do that. Uh, but that'll also help address uh, some of the tube life issues, uh, and uh, and we're learning more about the thermal uh, uh, characteristics uh, as as we go too, and and recognizing what we think the real limitations are in terms of rate of fire are for uh, max range shots, um, but keeping the fact that ERCA as a we're thinking 70 kilometers as a GS system, uh, but one of the tactical missions for an artillery battalion will always be reinforcing. Uh, and if you ever have to use the, the IRCA battalion to reinforce a direct support battalion, uh, it's going to be having a you know, higher volume of fire at shorter range. Uh, and, uh, and once we think that, you know, that rate of fire capability with, uh, you know, with, you know, regular normal HE uh, projectiles is going to come in handy. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure we're um, maximizing the, the barrel life for those things too. Over. Yeah, excellent. Um, we're going to run out of time and we've still got questions, but this might be the last one. We'll see. Can you talk about the capabilities that you're developing, the IRCA, precision missiles, strategic cannon? How do you see them flowing into the force? What what new or old force structure is going to hold these things and what command and control lash-ups uh, will direct their employment? Yeah, so at the strategic uh, uh, level, there, there'll be something called a strategic fires battalion. Uh, and the uh, Strategic Fires Battalion, whether it works for uh, uh, another emerging organization called the Theater Fires Command uh, in Europe and a Theater Fires Element in uh, in the Pacific. And so the the I think the the command and control structure for the Strategic Fires Battalion is um, is I think still to be determined. There's a couple dotted lines on the on the charts that I've seen, uh, and we've got time to make those decisions. But uh, but what but you know this is a you know, we're working across all the domains uh, to deliver capability, and, and so force structure is obviously a, an important one. Uh, we uh, got this, uh, you know, AROC across the uh, uh, the finish line about 10 months ago with um, with uh, General McCombell on the decision for uh, the IRCA as a as a as a battalion in a division structure. Uh, but uh, but where are the bill payers for that? We're still we're still working on that, and and I know that you know we're like I said we're. Uh, joined at the hip with the uh, the fire center of excellence uh, and the field artillery commandant for uh, for options for that. Uh, but that will um, we our analysis shows us how much of uh, you know the self-propelled howitzer force needs to be IRCA in order to in order to ch really dramatically change the the nature of uh, BCT direct fire engagements. And uh, and so uh, now it's kind of finding the sweet spot of um, of how many and, and where, but we're going to put 18 in a divisional uh, battalion, and then we're going to spend a year evaluating the operational concept, the whole thing, sustainment uh, to, uh, to to targeting and employment. And our, our idea is that maybe that would uh, that would culminate with a, uh, a CTC rotation, similar to what uh, First ID is doing uh, over the next uh, the next month or so uh, as a uh, as a divisional rotation of the CTC. Over. Great. As, as a uh... Has a decision been made which division is going to get that IRCA battalion yet? No, not yet. Okay. I'm going to shoot one quick one at you, and then uh, I'm afraid that'll be, have to be the end. Uh, 
John Legere asks, will self-correcting fuses be an industry solution? And is this solution being just, just developed at Picatinny or where? And how could this, how could John best have a conversation uh, with the Army on this? Um, so, um, so just tell John we're we're open for business. Uh, I'm happy to have a, a conversation with uh, with with him. And and the course correcting fuses are um, are um, you know a, a, I'd say a, a real partnership between uh, uh, government and industry. And obviously that the delivery of that uh, to Northrop Grumman uh, by Northrop Grumman to to um, uh, to the Army in the you know since we've been fighting in the Middle East to have the Precision Guidance Kit as a GPS uh, guided. Um, pretty low cost uh, front end fuse on a 155 projectile has been game changing for an employment of artillery in uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, and we know that uh, at 70 kilometers, the probable errors in range are in the hundreds of meters. So we have to have a course correcting fuse in order to uh, to uh, to get there. We'll we'll start with GPS, but then we're open to alternative sources of navigation. Uh, the uh, the integration of M code as a military code of uh, of GPS. Uh, and um, but 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 John, your your point is right that that uh, accuracy is going to be everything. And 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 sometimes I wish I could take uh, you know precision out of the title uh, for our for our title for our team, but but I, but I can't. It's too late. Uh, but but sometimes it gives people the wrong impression that that uh, you're 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 uh, preparing for large scale combat operations, and uh, and precision makes it sound like you're preparing for the last war. Uh, that's why I just I just call it accuracy. Uh, and uh, and that's what we need is accuracy to have effects at those extended ranges uh, using pretty expensive projectiles against uh, against high value targets. Um, you know that we we've got to invest in the in the fuses too. Short answer yes. And uh, and and John, I think you've got to get a hold of me and I look forward to it. Over. Excellent. So that's all the time we have for uh, us today, folks. But General Rafferty, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, thank you for your service and audience members. Thank you for your great questions and for joining us. Uh, we're gonna send you a survey at the end of this, tell us how we did uh, and how we can make these things better. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will have this recording up and on the website and also on YouTube, uh, probably in less than 48 hours. So again, thank you and have a great rest of your day.